Thanks for joining us today. Today we're, of course, continuing our series looking through the Gospel of Mark. And uh, before we jump into today's passage, I really just want to go back over very briefly last week's sermon uh, delivered by Pastor Craig. If you missed it, I highly encourage you to go take a look at it. He did a fantastic job going through the previous passage. Uh, But I want to just recap it because it does inform today's passage as well. So last week we looked at Jesus' confrontation with the Pharisees. In particular, this conversation had to do with what makes one person unclean. They were concerned about him not washing and his disciples not washing before they ate, uh, kind of against their traditions, and they saw that as making them unclean. And Jesus eventually in this conversation gets to the idea that what goes into your body does not defile you. Instead of what defiles you is what comes out, uh, both in word, action, thought, and really what he's getting at is those things represent the, the truth of where your heart is. That, uh, that it's basically the fruit of your heart. And a lot of times when those are evil, it's, or it represents a heart not aligned with God. And so he's really just getting at that idea. It creates a lot of conflict. And so I want us to hold that in mind as we head into today's passage because it's going to inform what we're looking at. And so let's get into it. We're going to be in Mark 7, starting at verse 24. We'll take a look at two different uh, stories of Jesus' miracles. It says, verse 24, And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. So Jesus now, he's going to, for the first time, leave Israel. He's going to actually go uh, from Canaan up to the or excuse me, Galilee, up to the northwest. He's going to leave the Jewish area into the the area uh, of the Gentiles. And... He's doing this for a couple of different reasons. The first has to do with uh, somewhat with the previous passage, that conflict that has been going on between him and the religious rulers, particularly the Pharisees. And he continues to to kind of poke at their their misunderstanding, their misuse of the word of God, uh, pointing people not towards God, but away from God. And that conflict is kind of reaching a boiling point. What we know in the future is this will eventually lead to Jesus's crucifixion. Uh, Jesus has this plan in mind that he's going to go to the cross, but it's not his time. He's manipulating the events according to the Father's will of when all this is to take place. And so he's actually going to leave the area where the Pharisees have influence. And he's also doing this because there's now starting to be some political turmoil. Uh, We previously talked about King Herod uh, and his putting to death of John the Baptist. He's also now starting to catch wind of Jesus. Really his supporters, though, are starting to catch wind of Jesus, the Herodians. Jesus is getting people riled up. It's not necessarily his desire, but they're starting to look at him. Hey, maybe this guy should be our king And so there's some conflict brewing in the background there as well. So he's leaving not just the area of the Pharisees, but also uh, Herod's uh, kind of kingdom. And so as he leaves, he goes to this house, right? He wants to be hidden. So the second reason now he's going and leaving uh, the, the, the Jewish area is to get away from them. He has throughout the throughout the gospel, sought out times of rest for himself and his disciples. And if you've been following along, every time he seemingly goes to get rest, uh, he's interrupted. And so now he's going away from uh, where his ministry has taken place, trying to find rest, but he's unable to. It says, But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him, came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. So Jesus and his disciples are in this house uh, of somebody who's unnamed. They're hidden out, but even there, right, they cannot escape the people who want to come and see Jesus. So this unnamed woman somehow finds out where Jesus is, and she just like barges into the door. From the other gospel accounts, this creates a bunch of turmoil. She falls down at the feet of Jesus, begging him to heal her daughter. The disciples are upset. They're like, get this, get this woman out of here. She's not invited. She doesn't have a place here. We're supposed to be meeting with Jesus, our rabbi, and they want to hear what he has to share with them, and get some rest. There's all this turmoil happening. 
And in the midst of it, you can just see this woman's despair. She is wrecked because her daughter is experiencing a a demon who has possessed her and is desperately seeking healing from Jesus. And this is a significant moment because this is now a Gentile woman in the Gentile region seeking out Jesus. And she would have been, right, living there, she would have likely been a pagan. She would have had her own God. Her people would have had their own gods. She would have not been uh, necessarily, uh, she would have been aware of Yahweh probably, but not a follower of Yahweh. This was a big moment. This woman was leaving behind all she knew to come and, and seek out Jesus. And from the other Gospels, again, when she falls at his feet, the way she's addressing him reveals what she believes. She addresses him as Lord. She addresses him as the son of David. Like this is big. She is proclaiming not just that he's a Jew. This title is a messianic title. She's looking at him in a way that maybe no other people at the time are. She seems to be catching on. This guy's more than just maybe a prophet or some really powerful guy. There's something really special about Jesus. And as she's begging for him, there's this really controversial statement that Jesus makes. He looks to her and he says to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. This seemingly is a way which we have never seen Jesus interact with anyone in need. The statement that he makes, right, and I'm going to dig into this, but it probably stuck out to you. What he's drawing an analogy between is this one Gentile woman and a dog. In essence, he's referring to her as a dog. But what he's doing is kind of flipping this idea on its head. See, at the time, uh, the Jewish people, and there's some debate whether they did this uh, commonly in practice or just held this idea that was like mentioned several times, but they didn't use it uh, commonly in referring to them. But the idea was that Jewish people looked at Gentiles as dogs. And they had a very specific word in the Greek. It was kion, right? And so it was dog, but it actually carried some greater connotation that it wasn't just dog, it was wild cur. This was a a demeaning term for the Gentiles. It was like uh, like you are a mangy, flea-ridden, scavenger dog who nobody wants, who eats uh, rotting flesh. That was what they pointed to. I actually remember Jamie and I, we, before we had kids, we went to Roatan, uh, this island in the uh, south, of, uh, south of Mexico, and we're there to go scuba diving, some other stuff. And this is, place is pretty run down. All the streets are are, uh, are, are dirt roads. People live in shacks. Like even the businesses are pretty run down. And as we would travel along the roads within the town, there would be these packs of wild dogs that would just follow you. They weren't a threat, but they were, they were dirty. They were a nuisance. They were trying to eat whatever you dropped. Like they would go around the businesses and dig in the garbage cans. And they were looked down upon. The people couldn't stand them. Nobody wanted them. They were just scavengers. That's what the Jews were referring to when they would call the Gentiles dogs. That's how they looked at them because they were unclean. They weren't followers of Yahweh. They were followers of other gods. Uh, They did things that would make them ritualistically unclean. And not only that, they were unclean in the sense of they were sinful. They were just looked down upon. But Jesus, again, he turns that phrase on its head because he doesn't use the same terminology, kion. He actually uses this other Greek word that still means dogs, just from a different way. And I'm going to butcher it because I really struggle with pronouncing Greek words. It's something like kanalion. And this word, yes, means dogs, but it means more um, little domesticated puppy. It's not a term of, uh, of like disgust at this dog. This isn't mangy mutt. This is more like a loving puppy, almost like your pet, a way you would refer, look at your dog, your pet. So he's, he's being countercultural of what the Jews would be to the Gentiles. It's not so much putting her down, but in the end, he is still calling her a dog. And he says this statement to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dog. She's coming for healing, and he at first is refusing her. He says no, right? And he's pointing to this big theological idea. Jesus, when he comes to earth, his earthly ministry is for the Jewish people. Right? That is what he has come. He is the Jewish Messiah. He's come to bring his people back to him. 
Now, ultimately, when he goes to the cross, he is for all peoples, all races, all religions. He is bringing them to himself. But during this time on earth, according to the will of the Father, he is coming and ministering to the Jewish people. And he says to her, right, the analogy is, let let the children Israel, Jewish people, be fed first. For it's not right to take the Jewish people's bread, right, and throw it to the dogs, to the Gentiles, right? He's, He's pointing to this theology, but also, right, he's pointing to her. I'm not here for you right now. I'm here for in that moment, his disciples, he's here for the Jewish people, right? He's not going to heal her because it's not his time to help these people yet. And as he says this, it's also this, this kind of test of faith for the woman. And I love the way she just kind of fires back at her, him because it can be read as kind of this, this battle, but in, really it seems more playful. She answered him, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She doesn't seem to take offense at Jesus calling her a dog. In fact, she kind of just says it right back to him. Like, yeah, I am a dog. You're right. I am a dog. This is the, the, uh, this is the Jewish people's ministry. This is the time for them. You are supposed to be serving them. I'm not going to take you away from them. Uh, I just want whatever's left over. She's like, the byproduct of your ministry is more than enough for what I have. And it's th- this, this, this conversation just draws forth all this imagery. I don't know about you guys. I have, uh, we love our animals. We have two full, gr- big-sized dogs. Uh, both of them are family pets. But we have uh, one of ours, Athena. She's really more of my pet. And I love that this just kind of brings this idea out. Every time we sit down for a meal per- together, particularly at breakfast or dinner, as we sit down, uh, all of us, my dog will come and lay at my feet for almost every meal. And she's good, well-behaved, at least in this part. She is a husky, so she can be rough. But she lays down there. She doesn't beg. She just lays at my feet. And as we're eating, of course, Jamie and I, we've made this food for all of us, for the two of us and our kids. Like that is the purpose we have created it for, made it for, prepared it, right? And our dog is there. We don't make that food for her. She has her own food, her dog food. And as we're eating though, what inevitably happens is things fall on the ground. One, because we have really young children and they like to eat in like the messiest way possible. Even a couple days ago, we were having hot dogs and one of them dropped it on the floor. Or even just in the eating anything. Like there's crumbs all over the floor. So our dog, as this will happen, will eat the piece of hot dog that falls. Or even the little scraps, the, the crumbs of the bread. She'll start licking it off the floor. She's our extra vacuum cleaner. And it just draws forth that imagery like, yeah, I create that meal for me and my kids, but even my dog who sits at my feet gets some of the, some of the meal. And that's what she's saying to Jesus. She says, I'm not trying to take you away from your calling. I'm not trying to take you away from ministering to the Jewish people. I just want whatever little scrap is left over because even that, the smallest fraction of the power that you have, is more than enough for what she's looking for. And Jesus' response, he said to her, for this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. After this response, Jesus, Jesus says, because of what you said, because of what really is revealed in what she said, Jesus heals her daughter. And in this, we see this this what Jesus really desires from all people, which is faith. Jesus desires her faith. She, he's it, Amongst the Jewish people, he desires their faith. Today, he desires our faith. That's what he wants for us, a heart aligned with him who believes who he is and what he can do. I actually want to go to this passage uh, this story in Matthew because he expounds on some of their conversation at the end. And he really, in that telling, hits home on what Jesus says. He says, answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. The reason Jesus responds in healing the daughter is because she reveals the faith that she has. And we see it and it's modeled for us the faith that Jesus desires in us, right? There's two things that stick out. She goes to Jesus. She falls at 
his feet. And Jesus, like she's begging for, for healing. She's declaring who he is. And then Jesus says to her, but you're a dog. You're a dog. You're not part of the kingdom. You're not fit to receive what I have. And she doesn't argue back. In essence, what she says is, Jesus, you're right. I am a dog. I am not worthy. And part of the faith that Jesus is looking for from us is to acknowledge that. We don't deserve Jesus. We don't deserve anything that he has to offer. We haven't earned it. She comes forth. She brings nothing to the table. All that she has is faith in who he is and what he can accomplish. And then out of that, this acknowledgement, this humility, she, in saying that, yeah, I'm like a dog, Jesus, or excuse me, the woman, she says, but here's the deal. I see who you are and I know that your power you have and any amount of power that you can, you can give to me, to my daughter is more than enough. She has faith, right, in who Jesus is, the power that he has. And that's what Jesus desires from each and every person. It's the, that the faith, when we come to Christ for the first time, is really what we're doing. We're looking to ourselves saying, I am. I don't deserve anything. There's nothing about me that makes me worthy to receive salvation and forgiveness from Jesus. But Jesus, because of who you are and the power that you have, right, you can make even a wretched dog like me a, 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 king, a, excuse me, a citizen of your kingdom. And in essence, that's what happens here. This woman who is a dog who doesn't deserve a seat at the table because of Jesus, and this is the same for all of us, instead of being dogs, we are adopted into his family, into his kingdom, so that we can too sit at the table as his children. And from here, uh, we're going to go into the second story. It says, verse 31, Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Decapolis. <laughs> Now, this first part of this story seemingly has really nothing for us uh, unless you happen to be like an ancient Middle Eastern geography scholar. I know myself, I'm not. Uh, but in looking through all this, <clears throat> the way that Mark writes this would have been immediately uh, obvious to the original audience that was written to. This statement would have stuck out and revealed something about what's going on. Because this route that Jesus is going to take uh, is the most out of the way route possible. Where he starts previous to the second, the previous story is <clears throat> he starts in Capernaum, which is right along the Sea of Galilee, and he's going to the Capitalist. This is like a straight shot across, but this is not the route he's going to take. In fact, he's going to take the seemingly longest route possible. For you and I today, this would be if I was to tell you I'm going to go to Portland, and immediately you would have this image that if I'm going to go from uh, Douglas County to Portland, I'm going to get on I-5 North and I'm going to drive three hours or seven hours if you hit traffic uh, straight to Portland. And, but the route that he's taking would be me saying, well, I'm not going to take I-5. Instead, I'm going to go out Diamond Lake and then I'm going to go north up past Bend and then I'm going to cut west to go back to Portland. Yes, it will get me there, but it is the long, inefficient route. And that's what Jesus is doing. This route that he's taking, again, because of all the conflict with the Pharisees and the Herodians and possibly Herod, he takes a route that looks something like this. He starts off here, the first story, he's over here, and then he goes all the way around and back down. And scholars believe this, this route, and this isn't meant to be exact, this is kind of an approximation, is something like 120 miles by foot. This is a long journey for Jesus and his disciples only get to get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And in, in this, he remains in, he remains in Gentile country. <laughs> and while he's there, it says, they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. <clears throat> So when they get there, right, Jesus still cannot escape the attention of people. And this group of men bring another man who, who cannot hear, who cannot speak, desperate for healing. And, and the idea here is that this is probably as a result of his short time when he crosses the sea and heals the demoniac. And that guy goes and tells the Decapolis, the, the ten cities, all about what Jesus has done. Likely what has happened is he has he's spread his word. These, this group of men have been searching for Jesus. He has arrived, and now he's going to heal this man. 
And then there's this weird interaction, verse 33, and taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And he looked at the heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. This has always been one of those very weird passages for me. For the longest time, I was quite like, what is Jesus doing? And I would get this explanation that what's happening is this is the way in which Jesus is healing this man. Right? In essence, he's, he's going to heal him, so he sticks his fingers into the guy's ear. He gives him a wet willy, and then he spits either on his own hand or the guy's tongue, which is really weird, and then he touches it, and then he looks up to heaven, and he says, be opened. Like Jesus has some special sequence of movement, like he's a magician or a genie. He has to do all these things, his incantation. But what we know about Jesus, this never made sense to me. What we've seen about his miracles, he can heal in any way he wants to. He doesn't even have to be present to heal. So why go through all of this? And what I found is this is not him doing, this isn't about him doing the healing. This is something else. We'll actually put a pin in that. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, and, and, and we're going to see really what Jesus is doing and why it's so important. But there's something else before we get to that I want to key in on. And this is something that Mark was trying to highlight that is lost in the English translation. Uh, we had this idea, he says speech impediment. And in the original Greek, he uses this particular word, mu uh, ialalos. And this word occurs only one place here in the New Testament. It's a word that's not really used very often in the Greek language at all. But he chooses this word for a very particular reason. It still means, uh, it still means mute or having a speech impediment. But this word shows up only one place else in the Bible. It's not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament, which if you are familiar with them, may already key you into something. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. It wouldn't have any Greek words. But the translation that they had at the time, the Septuagint, was their, their Old Testament translated from Hebrew into Greek. And this word, muilalos, shows up one place in the Old Testament as well. And it's here in Isaiah 35, 5 through 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute, that mute sing for joy. That's the word right there. And so what Mark is doing is he is making a very clear connection that would have been obvious to the Jews at the time that he's writing and referencing back that Jesus' action, this healing of this man, this clearing of his speech impediment was pointing back to the prophecy laid out in Isaiah. That he was making a direct connection. Jesus isn't just a prophet or a really good guy. He is something more than that. He is in fact the Messiah. He believed this was Jesus literally fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. Pointing once again, he is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh on earth. And it was a big deal for them and it would have been immediately obvious to them. Of course for us now translated to English, it doesn't stand out. And then he finishes everything up. <coughs> And Jesus charged them to tell no one. Like he always seems to do, he tells them, all right, don't tell anybody about this. And if you follow along, you probably know where this is going. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. Every time Jesus says, hey, keep this a secret. Don't go around telling everybody. Right? They want to tell everyone. People are so transformed by Jesus. They want everybody to know what's happening. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all the things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And so now I really want to just, uh, before we wrap up today, jump back to that interaction he has with the man. Because in there we see something about how Jesus interacts with him, but also with us. And that Jesus is personal. Jesus is a personal God, right? What's happening here is Jesus is really not just healing him, He's taking him aside and giving him his undivided attention. He's, he's focusing in on the man. He's really just seeing him and giving him uh, what he needs beyond the physical healing. It says, taking him aside from the crowd privately. Now, Tim Keller, I love his description of this. He talks about, for this man, his, his, his physical impairments would have made him a spectacle. It's not very common to run into somebody who both cannot speak, cannot hear. And so for a lot of people, they would have seen him. It would have brought a lot of pity upon him. He would have been known everywhere he goes. And Jesus just removes him from being a spectacle so he can address him one-on-one. -on -one. 
And then he puts his fingers into the ears. What Jesus is going to do, he's not, he's not doing this as a way of healing him. What he's doing is communicating to the man what's going to happen uh, when he heals him. He's letting them know what he's doing. He's actually, in a sense, using sign language to communicate. So he puts his fingers in the man's ears, right? You're stopped, your ears are stopped up, and I'm going to unstop them. He goes on, and he doesn't spit on the man. He spits on the ground and then touches his tongue. I'm going to unshackle what is keeping you from speaking. I'm going to remove it as though it was spit out. And then he looks up to heaven. He's drawing attention to who ultimately is doing this. This is because of God. God is the one who is healing you. And then he sighs. And I want to just really focus in on that. Because that one is not directly for the man, but it reveals something deep about Jesus. He's sighing because this isn't how it's supposed to be. Jesus, the creator of the universe, in his creation was perfection. There was no speech impediment. There was no deafness. There was nothing. Humans were meant to be in perfect bodily uh, uh, function. They were meant to be in perfect relationship with God. Everything was supposed to be perfect until sin enters the world. And Jesus sees this man, and the way he sees so many other people, he's just heartbroken. He's heartbroken because sin, not his, not his individual sin, but the far reaches of all sin, sin has ravaged, not, it ravaged this man's body. And Jesus is heartbroken, and it leads him to be overcome with compassion to the point where now he's going to heal him. And in this, we see just the way Jesus interacts with people. Right? He doesn't just come to heal them. He is a personal God. And he's ultimately pointing to what he desires. It's not, he doesn't come to just bring religion. He comes to bring personal relationship. He's not coming to bring forth just a bunch of checkboxes. He wants people to connect with him personally. That's what he desires for each and every one of us. He doesn't want us to just have this vague, we're followers of Christ. He wants personal relationship with each and every one of us. And I want us to, if we're going to be followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, we also want to follow in his footsteps. As we're living out our ministry in our day-to-day lives, we need to be personal people. We need to get on, a, go and see other people for who they are, what they're experiencing, interact with them. And I, again, I want to go back to that sighing. Jesus was heartbroken. Are you heartbroken for the lost? I know for myself, like, the easy answer is yes, but a lot of the times I don't, I don't feel that. I remember uh, when I uh, went to, I had dreams of being a firefighter and went to EMT school. And in the midst of it, I had an incredible instructor. I remember one day him, him stopping, and he wasn't giving us uh, medical instruction. He was actually just kind of prepping us for what we, was to come. And he told us something that stuck with me for a long, long time. He said, uh, you need to find a way to not connect with people that you are helping. And, and he expanded on that. Not that you don't care, but you cannot become heartbroken. You cannot become so sympathetic and get sucked into every call because it will wreck you. Right? You cannot care for every patient that you have at a deep level because what that will do is just burn you out. You need to find a way to put up a barrier between the people, between yourself and the people that you serve. You remain professional, you do the job as best you can, you treat them with respect, but you put up a barrier between yourself and them because you cannot handle being heartbroken for every person you, you come in contact with because what will happen is you will stop believing that this is their problem for you to help and instead you will just start to take on their problems and you will become a mess, you will burn out. And I think for myself, I think for a lot of us in the church as a whole, what we do is we take that on and run with it. We put up a barrier between us and the lost, and we forget what it is that where we came from, that we were once a lost people who desperately needed Christ, that Jesus' heart broke for us so much that it led him to the cross. When you look around at the people around you, the lost around you, and there's a lot just in Douglas County alone, does your heart break for them? Do you look at them as a person who needs a personal savior in Jesus Christ or just someone who is lost and and, and can't be bothered to be interacted with? Because ultimately that's what Jesus desires is a personal relationship with each and every one of us. I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. I love you guys. Have a good day.